Good evening. Has it been a good camp meeting? I hope it's the last one. You know, I, I don't say that because I don't like camp meeting. I'm quite fond of it. I just think that the camp meeting in heaven is going to be even better. Don't you agree? Well, tonight is the third and final installment of our series entitled Hope for the Homeland. Our first message, as you recall, was entitled Our Legacy, A Hope-Filled Past. This morning, our message was entitled Our Lifestyle, A Hope-Filled Present. And tonight, our message is simply Our Longing a hope-filled future. Before we get into the study of the Word this evening, what will we first do? Pray. It is essential that we pray before we open the sacred Word of God. Let us do that together. Father in heaven, we come before you just now And you are the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You are the God of the universe. And Father, tonight you are the God of our hearts. Lord, we do not deserve to come into your presence, but we are coming in because Jesus told us to come. Father, we're not coming timidly, we are coming boldly. And we pray right now by faith that you will hear us and that you will answer us. And Father, tonight that you will bless us with your spirit as we open the word, as we study the word, and Father, as we obey the word. Please, Lord, come, condescend to meet with your people now, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like for you to open your Bibles to first. Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Is that in the Old Testament or the New Testament? That's in the New Testament. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Beginning in verse 13, our message is entitled, Our Longing, A Hope-Filled Future. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13. The Apostle Paul writing here to the church at Thessalonica. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no... What's the next word? I want you to be aware that there are people that do not have hope. Verse 14, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with Him. Verse 15, for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, beloved, I want you to know that that right there is a sermon in and of itself. And just reading that passage of Scripture really would be adequate. But I have a few things I'd like to share with you this evening. We continue our series with a consideration not of the past or the present, but of the future. To announce to a Seventh-day Adventist crowd that we have a future hope is a little academic. We all know we have a future hope, a blessed hope, and a glorious hope. Our very name announces that we have a hope. We are, after all, Seventh-day Adventists. By the way, we were Adventists before we were Seventh-day. You knew that. 
We long for the advent, the appearing, the coming, the parousia of Jesus Christ. Nevertheless, though the information might not be new to most of us, it is still exceedingly timely and exceedingly important to understand from a biblical perspective the second coming of Jesus Christ. As Adventists, we should never tire of hearing the Word of God preached concerning the second coming. Jesus is coming again, and soon. The second coming of Jesus is mentioned not less than 1,500 times in the Bible. In fact, one out of every 25 verses in the New Testament is a direct reference to the second coming. It is a pervasive biblical theme. The Bible is saturated with the imagery and prophecy and teaching surrounding the second coming. Now listen carefully. The devil cannot do anything to prevent or postpone the second coming of Jesus. Did you get that? The devil cannot do anything to prevent or to postpone the second coming of Jesus. He is in this respect totally powerless. So far, so good. But here is where things get sticky. Really sticky. Though he cannot do anything to prevent it, he can do a lot to obscure it. The devil has invented his own version of the second coming and in directing the minds of millions of sincere Christians to this facade, he is complicating the picture. Literally millions of people are now totally enraptured, pardon the pun, with a false, unscriptural and dangerous concept of the second coming. The devil cannot stop the second coming, and so he has invented one of his own making. If you can't beat him, join him. And the name of Satan's masterpiece is the secret rapture. Maybe you've heard of it as the pre-tribulation rapture. Or perhaps you say tonight, David, I've never heard of the rapture, the secret rapture, or the pre-tribulation rapture. I say, good. But while many Adventists might be outside of the loop on this one, the rest of the world is not outside of the loop. They have heard of it. Many of them have never studied it from the Bible, but they have read about it in a series of novels written by two men, Timothy LaHaye and Jerry B. Jenkins. The series is entitled Left Behind. And if they didn't read it in one of the novels, they probably saw it on the big screen as this blockbuster movie, Left Behind, was inaugurated in cinemas two years ago to packed cinema houses. A sequel is planned to be out later this year, and it is destined to be even bigger. The Left Behind series is a series of 12 books, of which 10 have already been released, And I hope I am not telling you something that you do not know when I let you know that these books are selling literally like hotcakes. And brothers and sisters, not just Christians are buying them. Timothy LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins have usurped the legal drama author John Grisham as the top-selling authors the last two years. Now let that sink in. A man named John Grisham was selling more books than anybody for five years running, but he has been usurped two years in a row by Christian people. Christian books. Christian books on prophecy, but worse than that, incorrect books on prophecy. It is the number one selling series of all time ever in the history of book publishing. And brothers and sisters, since September 11th, sales in the Left Behind series have skyrocketed 60%. Now, as if all of this wasn't bad enough, I happen to have a subscription to Time Magazine. 
And four days ago, I received the latest issue of Time magazine in my mailbox. And on the cover, I was very fascinated to see a picture of the cross with flames all swirling around the bottom and these words written in the cross. The Bible and the Apocalypse. Why more Americans are reading and talking about the end of the world. And as you open it up and look inside, so far from being a biblical exposition about the Apocalypse, the end of the age and the second coming of Jesus, it is one great big advertisement for the Left Behind series. Now, brothers and sisters, please listen to me. These books are selling with a rapidity that is almost unbelievable, outselling even secular books. It is a dark day for the kingdom of God, but it is a bright day for Nelson Publishers. With this in mind, I invite you to consider with me soberly the passage that we just read. In this passage in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we are given a biblical hope. Can you say amen? Amen. It is a future hope, but it is not a secret hope. Without going into all of the details, the books in broad strokes forecast a secret rapture in which literally millions of the faithful will just up and disappear, leaving only their Levi's behind. Oh yeah, And unrepentant sinners are left behind as well. And that's why the series is entitled, Left Behind. Those who are left behind will have seven years to overcome the Antichrist, to refuse the mark of the beast, and to work with 144,000 converted Jews to convert the remainder of the world. And it sounds very fascinating, and I'm sure it makes for some heart-stopping reading. But, beloved, it has little, very, very little to do with Bible truth. Millions of sweet, sincere Christian people today are are enraptured with a hope, but it is not a biblical hope. Brothers and sisters, this thing is so dangerous. This thing is so totally pervasive and scary that it is incumbent upon us as Seventh-day Adventists to do absolutely everything in our power to rescue our dear brothers and sisters from this egregious error. So much more could be said about the Left Behind series, but we have heard enough error for the evening. Let us now explore what is true. Let us examine our longing, a hope-filled future. Our passage, our text, pardon me, or pardon me, our message will be divided into four components, four components. Number one is the blessed hope of the blessed hope. Number two, the blessed hope of the resurrection. Number three, the blessed hope of translation. And number four, the blessed hope of heaven and eternity. With this in mind, I invite you to turn with me to 1 John, 1 John chapter 3, 1 John chapter 3, as we explore the blessed hope of the blessed hope. 1 John and the third chapter. First John chapter 3. The blessed hope is just that. Blessed. The word blessed, of course, means happy. So then the second coming is a happy hope. I like that. Sure, for some folks it's going to be death and destruction. But think about it for just a moment. These people who will see the second coming as death and destruction have already chosen death and destruction. In rejecting the gospel and God's call upon them, they are saying, in effect, I'd rather have death than Jesus. For the wicked, the second coming will not deliver something that wasn't ordered. On the contrary, it will simply be the delivery for the order that was placed when the person rejected Jesus. 
One of the most incredible passages in all of the Bible is found in Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 36. And listen very carefully to this. Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 36. Pencil that down. Here's the verse. But he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul, and they that hate me love death. God says those that hate me love death. The second coming only speeds up the process of death that had already been set in motion by the sinner himself. So then the real focus of the second coming is not the wicked but the righteous. For them it is indeed a happy hope, yea, the happiest hope. And so many texts could be chosen from which to preach the blessed hope of the blessed hope. But I have chosen to preach it this evening from 1 John chapter 3. And verse 2, read it with me. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2. The apostle says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when we shall, or when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Verse 3, And every man that hath this, what is the next word? Every man that has this hope in him, purifieth himself even as he is pure. Now, beloved, let us take a look at this passage. Notice in verse 2, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. Can you say amen to that? He is affirming that we are already the children of God. In John chapter 1 and verse 12, it says, To as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God. And right here, right now at Michigan Camp Meeting, we are already the children of God. Amen. But the passage goes on, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. We are the sons of God by faith, but we are not the sons of God in terms of our our visual stimulus. We look around us and we see evidences of death and destruction and sin and wickedness. Our knees ache, our backs ache, our head aches, our vision is going blurry, our hair is turning gray, our hair is falling out. We are the sons of God, but sometimes we don't feel like the sons and daughters of God. Amen. Amen. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. We shall be like Jesus. Beloved, I'm I'm, I'm not sure if you're aware that there is a tension in the New Testament between the already and the not yet. The already is that we have received all of the promises, all of the blessings, all of the munificence and beauty right here and right now by faith. So we already have it, but we don't yet have it in reality. God has already given us eternal life. Amen? He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son hath not life. We have eternal life right now as a present possession in the here and now, but it doesn't always feel like we have eternal life. There is a tension in the New Testament between what God has already done and the fact that we've not yet seen it consummated. And that is exactly what John is bringing out in the text. He says, now we are the sons of God. It's a done deal. It is signed, sealed, and delivered. Wait, it's not delivered. It's coming. We know that we will be like Him. How can you be so sure that we'll be like Him, John? Because we're going to see Him as He is. As Seventh-day Adventists, we have an axiomatic expression that you already know by heart. By beholding, we are what? Changed. From one level of Christian character development to the next level of Christian character development, as we behold Jesus, we are slowly, gradually, sometimes exhaustingly slow, we are transformed into the image of Jesus. But when we see Jesus in His glorified condition, then we will be transformed into our glorified condition. I used to live in South Dakota, and I suppose it's probably the same here in Michigan. 
Sometimes it would, it would snow through the whole night and everything would be blanketed with a, with a beautiful, fresh, light, fluffy layer or covering of snow. And if you had, say, just been in your bedroom and, and the, the shades were down and it was dark, the door was closed and the lights were off, and, and say you woke up a little later, maybe you were studying your Bible and you go walking out of your room and you go walking outside maybe to get the paper or check the mail, and the sun is glaring down on that fresh layer of snow, it can literally burn the eyes. Now listen very carefully to this illustration. The danger of burning the eyes is only if you go from a very, very darkened state into an exceedingly bright state because the pupils are fully dilated and then when you go outside, the retina is burned before it has chance to react. But if you go from a darkest room to a little lighter room to a little lighter room to a little lighter room and then you go outside, there is no danger of getting burned. Now think about the second coming of Jesus. Many people have been dwelling and living in their little hovels of sin and darkness. And when Jesus appears, He is simply going to be bright and glorious and beautiful. And because they have had no time to acclimate, because they have had no time to get adjusted to glory, changing from glory to glory to glory, when they see Him in His fullness, it will be like the snow on the sunshiny day, and they will die, beloved. That's why Christian character development is essential. We will only be transformed if we are being transformed here. We will only be glorified if we are being sanctified. If we just step out into the brightness of Christ's excellency and we have no preparation, we will perish. Beloved, that is exactly what John is saying. Look at the passage again. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not appear what we shall be, but we know that when we, He shall appear, we shall be like Him for or because we will see Him as He is. Verse 3, And every man that has this hope in him purifieth himself, even as He is pure. Do you have that hope tonight, yes or no? Do you have the hope of being transformed into the character likeness of Jesus? Do you have that hope? Well, beloved, then it's time, by the grace of God, to be purified in the here and now. I repeat, unless we are being changed here, we will not be changed then. Unless we are being sanctified here, we will not be glorified then, according to this passage, the second coming plays an essential role in the saving of humanity. And please listen very carefully, because I want to address a, a subtle, uh, I don't want to call it a heresy, but it is certainly a perversion of the truth, a subtle perversion that is creeping ever so slowly into our ranks. According to this passage, the second coming plays an essential role in the saving of humanity. Many want to relegate the entire scope and breadth of salvation to the justification experience, but salvation in the larger biblical sense occupies more than just justification. Now stay with me here. Of course, justification is essential. It is the cornerstone of our salvation, but salvation also includes transformation both of the character, sanctification, and of the body, glorification. Bible salvation set against the backdrop of the great controversy entails all three, justification, sanctification, and glorification. It is the complete restoration of man into the image of God, and the second coming plays an essential role in the salvation of mankind. Can you say amen? Now, I'm all for justification by faith. I repeat, it is the cornerstone of our salvation, but it is not the totality of our salvation. Beloved, we have this hope. This hope purifies. This hope cleanses. This hope washes. This hope bathes. If somebody is waiting and looking forward to the second coming of Jesus, you can tell. Did you hear what I said? 
If somebody is looking with longing expectation for the second coming of Jesus, you can tell it. Like the old song says, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. We have taken a look at the blessed hope of the blessed hope. The blessed hope can be further subdivided into three categories. Number one, resurrection. Number two, translation. And number three, heaven and eternity. Let's take a look at resurrection. Go with me to Daniel chapter 12. Daniel in the 12th chapter. Let us take a look at the resurrection component of the blessed hope. Now, I don't need to tell Seventh-day Adventists where the book of Daniel is, do I? Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12, and I'm beginning in verse 1. My Bible says, and at that time shall Michael stand up. As Daniel was looking down through the stream of time, as Daniel was looking down through the corridors of prophetic time, he said, and that time, at that time shall Michael stand up. But there will come a day when it will no longer be at that time, but it will be at this time. What happens when Michael stands up? Notice verse 1. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. That does away with the secret rapture, beloved. There will be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book. What book would that be? That would be the book of life, verse 2. And many of them that sleep, many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt and they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever and ever. There's going to be two resurrections, beloved. How many? Now you knew that, right? There's going to be the first resurrection and the second resurrection. Now which resurrection do you want to come up in? First resurrection. Why? Because those that come up in the first resurrection, on such the second death has no power. Now listen to me carefully. Why does God need a resurrection? God has solved the problem of death. He proved it when He raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Because Jesus Christ's resurrection paved the way for the saints' resurrection. God did not solve the problem of death by giving man an immortal soul. Did you get that? Man is mortal. He dies. God told Adam that it would happen, then the devil concocted the sweetest of all lies. Ye shall not surely die. And today thousands of pagans and thousands of Hindus and thousands of Muslims and thousands of New Agers have bought into it. I I am sad to report to you this evening that even thousands of Christians believe that ye shall not surely die. You just kind of die. The pagans used this farce of a teaching to comfort themselves in death and the papalists used it to raise money in the dark ages. God has a solution to the problem of death and that solution is the resurrection. In his book entitled Countdown, G.B. Hardy articulates the issue with refreshing, albeit cutting, clarity. Listen carefully. G.B. Hardy says there are but two essential requirements. How many requirements? Two. Number one, has anyone cheated death and proved it? And number two, is it available to me? You got it? Two requirements. Has anyone cheated death and proved it? And number two, is it available to me? Now notice what he goes on to say here. Here is the complete record. Confucius' tomb, occupied. Buddha's tomb, occupied. Muhammad's tomb, 
occupied. Jesus' tomb, empty. He concludes his paragraph by saying this, argue as you will, but there is no point in following a loser. Are you with me? Now that is not to make some kind of a statement about the people that choose to follow Buddha or Confucius or Muhammad. The point is just this. If they're still in the tomb, they're still in the tomb. And beloved, if you follow them, you'll follow them right into the tomb. But we can go into the tomb, but hallelujah, our Savior came back out of that thing and we can follow Him in and we can follow Him right back out. That is the resurrection. God has solved the problem of death. Jesus went into the tomb, but He came out of the tomb, and the entire New Testament revolves around the issue of the resurrection. More than 40 times that word appears. Resurrection, resurrection, resurrection. It was the cornerstone and the capstone of the entire message that the apostles preached. God raised Jesus from the dead. You go read Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. What did Peter preach? He preached the resurrection. Read the book of Acts. What did Paul preach? He was always... In fact, let's look at it. He was always preaching the resurrection. Look at this one. Acts chapter 17. We have to look at this. The reason we have to look at it is that Paul was preaching to a bunch of smart people. Now, I believe that God loves smart people, but I believe that they're harder to save than some the rest of us. Because sometimes they're just a little too smart for God. Beloved, we can educate ourselves right out of the faith. We can get so smart that we know better than God. And in Acts chapter 17, we find the story of Paul. And Paul is preaching to a bunch of smart people. He's preaching to the people of Athens. And we pick it up in verse 32. Acts chapter 17 and verse 32. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead... That is all of the smart Athenian philosophers at the Areopagus. Verse 32, And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked and others said, We will hear of thee again about this matter. Verse 33, So Paul departed from among them. Notice verse 31. What was it that got them so stirred up? It's what Paul said in verse 31, Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness. So far, so good. The pagans could believe in that. They believed in Zeus and all of their foolish gods. But what he said next was too much for them to stomach. By that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he raised him from the dead. And when he spoke of the resurrection of the dead, some of them mocked. In other words, the resurrection, the miraculous resurrection, did not fit into their paradigm of naturalism. It did not fit into their paradigm of of only materialism, and it, it would necessitate a miracle for somebody to die and then come back to life. And they said, oh, we can't believe that. And beloved, that is a hand and glove fit with the age in which we live today. Even many Bible scholars are going through, and here's the fancy word for it. The fancy word is demythologizing. Never heard of that word, have you? We have scholars, not our church, praise God, but there are scholars. I better be careful what I say. There might be a couple. The Lord Jesus can save them too. There are scholars who will just go paging through here and what they're looking for is all the miracles and when they find a miracle, they try to find a way to explain it in a naturalistic way and so they are in their own erudite academic way demythologizing the Bible. But I'm here to tell you this evening that there is a resurrection. The Lord Jesus was raised from the tomb and that gives us assurance that He can raise you and I from the tomb if we were to go there. Now, this whole bit about the resurrection, I used to preach it, but I preach it different now. Let me tell you why. For the last three years, I have been involved in full-time evangelistic ministry. I enjoy coming into a church, and working with a pastor, and then leaving. You don't have to put up with all of the difficulties and vicissitudes and problems that arise in, in, in staying in one place. And I remember I used to just 
you know, loathe the sorry lot of the pastor. Now, I love the pastors, and I knew that they loved being pastors, but for me and my house, we will be evangelists. And then the Lord Jesus came knocking on my heart's door one day. He said, David, I want you to be a pastor for a while. A pastor? In one place, Lord? In one place. But for how long, Lord? For a while. (laughs) So we pulled our old house, which is a 1988 Jeep Cherokee, up into the driveway of our new house, which has a foundation and a bedroom and a basement. And we have been pastoring the Troy Church for the last six months and I want to go on record as saying, I love it. I really love it. Being a pastor is not drudgery. Amen, pastors? Now it is challenging, but it's not drudgery. Well, anyway, the phone rang. I've been there for about two weeks. And a church member that I had only met one time before said, Pastor... You need to come to the hospital immediately. My husband is dying. We have an associate pastor. His name is Pastor Glenn Heil, and I love that man with all of my heart. And I was going to call him and ask him to go on the visit, but he was out of town. So I put on my clothes, I got in my Jeep. And I drove to the hospital and I was not prepared for what I found there. Here was a man, a young man, 40, 45, hooked up to tubes and machines, things in his mouth, things in his arm, things attached all over to him. And he was not conscious. He was just laying there. And there was mom, his mom and his wife, and his children, and his brothers, and his sisters standing all around the bed. And here comes the pastor riding in, going to make everything all right. Well, the pastor was just as scared as everybody else in that room. Probably more so. And beloved, I sat there for the better part of an hour. And it was a crushing blow to my heart. I mean, it was a crushing blow to my heart when, when those, those nurses' aides came in and very unceremoniously just turned the machine off. And right there in front of my eyes, I had to watch this man. <gasps> and he was gone. And the worst part wasn't that he was gone, but that there were people that weren't gone people that had to stay right there in that room and they had to watch him die. A husband dying, a child dying, a father dying, a brother dying. And at that point, I began to appreciate the resurrection far more than I ever had before. He might have passed away there in that room, but I am confident that man had given his life to the Lord Jesus and he will be resurrected. Brothers and sisters, there is a grand hope. Perhaps you today are here this evening. Perhaps you have a loved one who has gone into the tomb. You have a loved one who is asleep in Jesus. Maybe a spouse, maybe a mother, maybe even a son. Beloved, I want to give you the assurance tonight. If your loved one fell asleep in Jesus, he or she is going to wake up in Jesus. God is not going to leave your loved one in that tomb. God is going to come and rescue them. And I know He's going to rescue them because He rescued Jesus. He raised Jesus and so we have confidence that He can raise our loved ones too. I believe in the resurrection. Death is an enemy. When you're staring death right in the face, it is ugly. And it dawns on you God never intended for you to see death. And you look at it right in the face and the devil you're looking the devil in the face and he stares right back at you. But you will laugh last when those people are resurrected to live forever. Beloved, we have the hope of the blessed hope and we have the blessed hope also of the resurrection from the dead. Now how about the blessed hope of translation? Go with me in your Bibles to the text that we opened up with, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 
1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Point number three. The blessed hope of translation. When you start talking about translation, now you're talking my language. I can remember as a child being terrified of death. Literally terrified. When I became a Christian, things got better, but I am still not fond of death. I want to go on record as saying, I just don't want to die. Should the good Lord allow it, I will accept it, but I'm pulling hard for translation. I want to be a member of the Ark Club. Did you get that? The Ark Club. A-R-C. Now, do you know what the Ark Club is? Let me show it to you right here in the passage. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I want to be a member of the Ark Club. It's not an easy club to get into. As it stands right now, there's only two members. Enoch and Elijah. Notice verse 13 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. That's the resurrection. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus, God will bring with Him. That's the resurrection. And I I would be satisfied with resurrection, but I don't want to be resurrected. I'd rather just live right up to the second coming. Now here's the art club, verse 15. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive, a, and remain are unto the coming sea of the Lord, shall not prevent them which are asleep. The alive and remain unto the coming club. That's the art club. You want to be in it? Lord, sign me up. That we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Why, Paul? What's going to happen to those who are alive and remain? Oh, i got some good news for people like you, David. Verse 16, For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel. There is no secrecy here. Amen? It's the loudest text in all the Bible. Shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the trump of God. I'm a trumpet player. Those things are loud. Ask my mother. (laughs) The trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then here it is again. We which are alive and remain shall be caught. There it is again. A-R-C. Alive and remain and caught up. Shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, David Asherick is greatly comforted with these words. Amen? Do you want to be in the ark club? Those that are alive and remain unto the coming. Those that are alive and remain and will be caught up. And if the good Lord in His wisdom and providence sees fit for me to go down into the grave, I will not lose faith, but oh, how I want to live to see Jesus. The Bible has another term for the art club. You know what that name is? It's the 144,000. Go with me in your Bible to Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6. Now, you know where to find the book of Revelation, right? Revelation chapter 6. Let's take a look at the opening of the sixth seal. Revelation chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 12. John writing, he says, And I beheld, when he had opened the which seal, everyone? Six seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, or sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places, and the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said unto the mountains and rocks fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the what everybody lamb for the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand revelation chapter 6 ends with a question 
John looks there on the rocky island of Patmos. He's looking down through the corridors of time and he sees the second coming of Jesus and it looks so terrific and terrible and powerful and cataclysmic. He said, who can stand through that incredible catastrophic time? Who could make it through that time? And that's how the chapter ends with a question. It ends in the interrogative, not the declarative. And then we pick it up immediately in Revelation chapter, guess what? Seven. It's always a good idea to to just keep reading. Revelation chapter 7 and verse 1, And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the which direction, everyone? East, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. And notice what he says, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of God in their where? Foreheads. And here it is, verse 4. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed an hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Now remember, Revelation chapter 6 ends with a what, everybody? A question. The question was, who can stand? Who can make it through that terrifically penetrating and difficult time? Who can stand through the catastrophic, cataclysmic second coming of Jesus? Who could make it? And then the answer comes resounding to us in Revelation chapter 7. The 144,000 will be alive when Jesus returns. See, that's why they can sing a song that nobody else can sing. They can sing a song that nobody, they can sing a song that Moses can't sing. And they can sing a song that Abraham and Isaac and Jacob can't sing. Why? Because they have passed through an experience that nobody before or since has ever passed through the experience of not seeing death and living right through the very end of the worst time of trouble this nation has ever seen. That will be awesome. Because the darkest day, the darkest day that this planet has ever seen will be superseded and overshadowed by the brightest, most glorious day this planet has ever seen. The contrast will be incredible. Did you notice it in verse 16? Did you notice in Revelation 6.16? And said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of Him that setteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. The wrath of the what is that? The Lamb, beloved. Now, if you, if you were walking through the jungle and a tiger came out and chased you down, you'd probably run away from the wrath of the tiger. But if you just happened to be walking through your local barnyard and a lamb came scurrying out toward you, and if your wife was there, you would look funny if you went scurrying away in horror from that lamb. <laughs> Things would be different between you and your wife after that. Beloved, here's the point. Why are they running from the wrath of a lamb? Because remember back, they've not been adjusting slowly to the light. They've not been transformed from glory into glory. And so they're going to walk from perfect darkness into perfect light. And they will see wrath on the face of a beautiful, innocent, compassionate, tender, docile lamb. Oh, beloved, he's not coming back as a mean, ferocious beast. He's coming back as a lamb. I believe today in the blessed hope of translation. And the Lord Jesus and I have had long talks about this. And oh Lord, I want to be in that number. When the saints, the translated saints, go marching in without seeing death. Point number four. The blessed hope of heaven and eternity. Stay right there in the book of Revelation. Listen to my words very carefully. Heaven is all about Jesus. Did you hear that? In fact, if you study the Bible carefully, you will find that the Bible does not reveal all that much about what heaven will be like. When it comes to raw information, what we don't know is far greater than what we do know when it comes to heaven. Sure, it's going to be grand, it's going to be joyous, it's going to be splendid and delightful and wonderful. All of the emotions we know, but the particularities of what heaven will be like and what we will do there, we are largely uninformed. 
Now, there is one particularity that we can be certain about, and it is the best of all, and we find it in Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22. We don't know what heaven will be like exhaustively, but we do know the most important part, and we find it in Revelation 22, beginning in verse 1. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the who, everybody? Lamb. In the midst of the street of it and on either side of the river there was the tree of life which bare twelve manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Verse 3, And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and His servant shall serve Him. And here it is in verse 4, And they shall see His face. In my estimation, and I am not a theologian, in my estimation, that verse right there is the climax of the book of Revelation. And they shall see His face and His name shall be in their foreheads. Beloved, one day we are going to see Jesus. Now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now we know only in part, but then we shall know even as we also are known. Amen. Face to face with Christ my Savior. Face to face, what will it be when with rapture I behold Him, Jesus Christ who died for me? Only faintly now I see Him with the darkening veil between But a blessed day is coming when His glory shall be seen. What rejoicing in His presence when our banished grief and pain, when the crooked ways are straightened and the dark things shall be plain. Face to face, O blissful moment. Face to face to see and know. Face to face with my Redeemer, Jesus Christ who loves me so. Oh, beloved, we're going to see Jesus. Now that is the climax and the apex of what heaven is all about. Heaven is about Jesus. Now I'm looking forward to the fruit and the food and the birds and the blooms. As a bird watcher, I am looking forward to keeping a universal life list of every bird that God has ever created. I'll be glad to swim with the dolphins and fly with the eagles. I'm going to have me a nice big house, two of them. When I get to heaven, I'm going to sing bass and soprano at the same time. I want to learn heavenly photography. I want to watch birds in heaven. I want to watch God create something. I want to eat from the tree of life. I want to drink the water of the river of life that flows from the Lamb's throne. I want to see the devil get licked. I want to walk on streets of gold. I want to live forever and I will. Yes, I am looking forward to heaven, but heaven is not about things. Heaven is about the King of Kings. Heaven is not about stuff. Heaven is about the Savior. And heaven is not about materialism. It's about the Messiah. Beloved, we will have, when we have been there 10,000 years, we will have an eternity still remaining to sing His praise. Tonight we have looked at the blessed hope of the blessed hope. The blessed hope of resurrection. The blessed hope of translation. And the blessed hope of heaven and eternity with Jesus Christ, our Savior. If you know it by heart, say it with me. Let not your hearts be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in Me. In My Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto Myself, that where I am, you may be also. Can you say Amen? Amen. Heaven is cheap enough. And we are headed there. As Seventh-day Adventists, our legacy is a hope-filled past. As Seventh-day Adventists, our our lifestyle is a hope-filled present. And as Seventh-day Adventists, our longing is a hope 
hope-filled future, beloved. Tonight we want to go to our final text. And then I have a very, very unique and compelling appeal to make to you this evening. I'm not going to let you off the hook that easy. The Lord Jesus is not going to let you off the hook that easy. Go with me to 1 Peter chapter 3 and we'll wrap this thing up. 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. Tonight I want to make two appeals. 1 Peter chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 15. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. This Scripture has the dubious privilege of being the first text of Scripture I ever memorized. 1 Peter 3.15 The Bible says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready, how often? Always. To give an answer to how many men? Every man that asketh you a reason of the, what's the next word? Hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Read it again. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to any man, every man that asketh you the reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. I have a question for you tonight. Do you have a hope? Do you have a past hope? Do you have a present hope? Do you have a future hope? Now, let me ask you a second question. Do you want to share that hope? Beloved, hope for the homeland is not about Seventh-day Adventists. Hope for the homeland is about non-Adventists. Preaching the gospel, bringing people into this glorious message, taking our hope and not being selfish and cloistered with it, but making it hope available to other people so they can savor what we have savored this weekend. Amen? Amen. Beloved, don't you think everybody in Michigan should be able to come to this camp meeting? You think they would have received the blessing? I got news for you. Most of them don't know what's going on. They're not here because they don't want to be here. Most of them are here because they don't know about it. Well, I suppose then we've got our work to do. We've got exactly one year. One year before camp meeting comes around again, and here is my two-tiered appeal. The first appeal is this. I am just sure in an audience this size, there must be someone here who has not yet joined the Seventh-day Adventist church, but God has been speaking to your heart. You're not joining the church because it's a church. You're joining the church because it follows and practices and teaches and believes the Bible. Can you say amen? Amen. Now, there must be somebody in a crowd this size who has not yet made that surrender. And let me speak to you now, not so much as a preacher, but as a friend. The Lord Jesus Christ tonight is holding out to you not only a hope-filled future, but a hope-filled present of a glorious and beautiful lifestyle and a hope-filled past that is scripturally rich in its heritage. And tonight I want to make, in behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ, who cannot be with us in person, I want to make an appeal to you, O person, whoever you are this evening, maybe there's one, maybe there's two, maybe there's ten, somebody here this evening who has not yet made that decision, Somebody who's been thinking in their mind, should I join, should I not join? Beloved, it's not about a church, it's about Jesus. And the Bible says Jesus gave Himself for the church. And if you join His church, you're joining the body of Jesus. And I want to make an appeal tonight. Is there somebody here this evening that has not yet chosen to join this community of faith and you want to say by coming down to this altar, I want to join God's remnant community? Is there one or two that will do it? Now, beloved, listen to me. I understand. I understand in an audience this size, everybody's going to look at me if I get up. But let me tell you something, beloved. Everybody in this room is rooting for you. The Lord Jesus Christ is rooting for you. That's my first appeal. We're going to sing a song in just a moment and you will have ample opportunity to come forward. But here's the second appeal and this one is for you died in the wool Seventh-day Adventists. Now this appeal is a strong one. But I believe it is a biblical appeal. I'm going to ask you to enter into a covenant commitment with God. Are you ready? Here it goes. I'm going to invite people this evening
to take their Bible, their own Bible, your personal Bible, the Bible that you study with, the Bible that you wake up and have your devotions with, your Bible, the Bible that is in your lap right this moment, and I'm going to invite you to open up to the first blank page wherever you can find a place to write. And you're going to take out your pen. Go ahead and do it right now because I have a feeling that everybody in this room is going to make this commitment. And you're going to find the first... If you're like me, i got writing all inside of here, but you're just, you only are going to have one sentence. Just find any blank spot on your Bible and I'm going to tell you what to write. And it is very, very simple. Have you been encouraged this, this camp meeting, yes or no? I want to emphasize, beloved, that we have this hope. But it is wrong of us and selfish of us to keep this hope to ourselves. Amen? So this is what I want you to write. I want you to draw a line that looks like a blank. Just a blank line. Just about, oh, I don't know, an inch and a half long. And once you've drawn that line, I want you right after that line to write this. Was baptized on the blank. Write another blank. So this is what it looks like. Blank was baptized on the blank day of the blank month, comma, 2003. Write it down. Are you ready? Blank was baptized on the blank day of the blank month, 2003. And then after 2003, this is what you're going to write. Because the Lord Jesus Christ used me to win this beautiful soul to Himself and to His last day message. Now you're getting a feel for it now, aren't you? You're going to get quiet on me. I repeat, blank was baptized on the blank day of the blank month, 2003, comma. Because the Lord Jesus Christ used me to win this beautiful soul and to Himself and to His last day message. Now, it's blank this evening, but you have approximately one year and four months in your own time. In what did I say? In what did I say? In your own time to go find somebody in your neighborhood or somebody in your family or somebody in your job or somebody that lives next to you, wherever it is, you have ample opportunity to go find that person and to start studying the Bible with them and maybe you'll get to the Sabbath issue and they're not interested. Then you have time to go find somebody else and here is the covenant commitment with God. You will say tonight, by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, this time next year, I will have won somebody to this Hope that I have. Now, beloved, just think about that. There's approximately 2,500 people in this auditorium tonight. If everybody took this commitment, we'd have 5,000 next year. And then if we made the commitment again, we'd have 10,000. You know what I was tempted to do at the Troy Church? I was tempted. I don't think Pastor Gallimore would go for this. But I was tempted to make membership contingent upon every single member baptizing one person every year. And if we came to the end of the church books and you hadn't won somebody, well, you weren't working, you weren't doing your work. And so, this fellowship, and now somebody can win you. Amen? Now, beloved, I'm serious about this. I want you to know the Lord Jesus Christ will bless your efforts. You write it down right there. Blank was baptized on the blank day of the blank month, comma, 2003, because the Lord Jesus Christ used me to win this beautiful soul to Himself and to His last day message. God can use you to win somebody to the Seventh-day Adventist message. Amen? God can use plumbers and painters. God can use skateboarders. God can use whoever. God can use you. And tonight, I want to know, by the raising of your hand, Seventh-day Adventists, how many people want to say, I sense the solemnity and the hugeness of this covenant agreement, but by the grace of God, I am entering into an agreement to do everything in my power to bring somebody with me by this time next year. How many people want to say in a solemn declaration of a covenant agreement before God, I'm going to try my best. Raise your hand to heaven. Hallelujah, beloved. And we'll make it again next year. 
Oh, brothers and sisters, if each one reached just one, this message would go like wildfire. we got plenty of dynamic preachers. We need more foot soldiers. And as we close this evening, I want you to sing with me this great anthem of Adventism. We have this hope. What do we have, everyone? This hope. And I extend that first invitation. Don't think you're getting off the the, the hook that easy, beloved. The first invitation that is being offered to anybody and everybody who wants to say, I will take a stand with Jesus. I will take a stand with His last name message. I will take a stand with this church and this community of faith. I want to be a member of God's last day church. I want to invite you while we sing this anthem of praise to come racing down to this altar because time is short, beloved. Amen? The Lord Jesus Christ will be waiting right here with open arms to receive you into His bosom as you tonight make a stand for Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Let us stand to our feet and sing this incredible hymn, this anthem of praise. We have this hope. This hope that burns within our heart, hope in the coming of the Lord, we have this faith that Christ the Lord imparts, faith in the promise of His Time is near when the nations far and near shall awake and shout and sing Hallelujah Christ is King We have this hope that burns within our hearts hope in the cause of the Lord. Beloved, do you enjoy that song? Yes. Well, we're going to sing it again. I know that there are people in this auditorium. There is at least one saint. Maybe he's 18 or maybe he's 80 who needs to take a stand tonight on the side of truth. Beloved, I have been known to sing songs multiple times through. It is not time to back down. The Lord Jesus is calling tonight. The devil's favorite word is tomorrow. The devil's favorite word is wait. And I am just sure that there is somebody in here this evening, some young man, some older man, some young lady, some older lady who wants to come down right here to the front and say, I want to set up my salvation in the camp of the Lord Jesus Christ. Beloved, so let us sing this anthem of praise again. And I plead with you on behalf of Jesus, don't be afraid to come forward right now. We have this Let's sing it again. 
We're going to sing it one more time. And we're going to sing it as though it's the last time we ever get to sing it. Amen. 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 We're going to sing it tonight like we know we're not going to wake up tomorrow morning. So sing it with all of the energy, all of the enthusiasm, all of the verb you can muster. And while you're singing with your mouth, pray with your heart that that one more soul will come forward and will make the decision to take a stand this night for God's truth. Amen. Amen. Let us sing We Have This Hope. We have this hope that burns within our hearts. Hope is the coming of the Lord. We have this faith that must follow the heart. Faith in the promise. for the decisions that were made tonight. And I am sure that there are others out there who wanted to come forward, who felt the tug of the Spirit on their heart saying, go forward, but there was another voice that said, maybe now is not the right time. Listen to me very carefully. I make myself available. Pastor Gallimore is here. He is available. Pastor Nelson is available. Pastor Collins is available. If you have other pastors, I mean, if there's ever a place to find a pastor, you're here. And if you're having that desire in your heart, or maybe you just have questions, and you think to yourself, yeah, it sounds good, but I just have one question I need to have answered. I have just two questions I've got to have answered. Do not rest tonight until you speak to a pastor. Beloved, tonight let us pray. Let us pray. Father in heaven, you are God in heaven. Father, we are but dust. You are the Creator. We are the created. Father, You are the God of this earth. You are the God of this country. And You are the God of Michigan Camp Meeting and Michigan Conference. Father, tonight we just want to praise the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the great Jehovah God of the universe. You alone are worthy to receive the highest praise and adoration. And Father, You have manifested Yourself to us here at this camp meeting. And Father, through the preaching of the Word, and through the singing of the hymns, and through the seminars, and through the music, through the fellowship, Father, You have met with Your people. You are every bit as real as we believe You to be. And Father, we pray that this will be the last camp meeting that we will ever experience. Lord, not because we lie down to sleep in the dust of the earth, but because You come to take us home. Because You come to make us members of the Ark Club, Father, the ones that are alive and remain unto the coming. Oh, Father in heaven, You have given us a glorious past, and we say thank You, Jesus. You have given us a glorious present, and we say thank You, Jesus. Father, You have given us a glorious future and we say thank You, Jesus. You have made it possible. And Lord, we want to pray right now for the outpouring of Your Spirit in latter rain portion, in latter rain measure for the upcoming meeting, September 13. Oh, Father, pour out Your Spirit upon this conference, upon this union, and every place where they will conduct a hope for the homeland, Bible, prophecy, seminar. Father, I want to plead with you. Bring a revival of 
primitive and authentic godliness to this conference. Father, be with our leadership. Uphold the hands of Pastor Gallimore, Pastor Nelson, Pastor Earls, Pastor Brook, Pastor Snaman. Uphold these men, Father, with your righteous right hand. Make them strong in the power of your might. Father, be with the pastors of this conference. Lord, fill them with Your Spirit and make them everything that they could be in Christ. Father, we think particularly of those five individuals that were ordained today. Father, we just plead with You to pour out Your Spirit in never before measure upon these five individuals. And Father, then pour out Your Spirit and continue to pour it even upon the laity, Father. Father, upon the oldest to the youngest, may every person receive bountifully of Thy Spirit. Lord, we are pleading. We are weeping, as it were, between the porch and the altar, Father. Only You can send the Spirit. And Father, we are the problem. We are in the way. We need to have our hardened hearts softened and we need to have self taken off of the throne of our lives. Father, tonight we are trusting to You. You are our God. You are our Savior. You are our King and we love You. Father, tonight we say thank You for the hope that You have given us as Bible-believing Seventh-day Adventist Christians. Thank You for this camp meeting. And most of all, thank You for Jesus Christ. We realize, Lord, that every gift is stamped with the cross of Calvary. Lord, please send us now to our homes, remembering this covenant agreement that we have made with You to bring a soul to Your kingdom within the next year. Father, please fill us with Thy Spirit and send us on our way. Godspeed. In Jesus' name. Everyone can say, Amen. Amen.